Well, good afternoon and welcome to this afternoon's webinar on Sluice Ferrari Company in Tanzania. For those of you who haven't joined these webinars before, the presentation will last around 20 minutes. And if you'd like to ask any questions, please do so in the chat box on your screen. And I'll be happy to go through at the end of the presentation and answer any questions you may have. Um, but hopefully I'll be covering most of the points you want to raise um, through my presentation. But yeah, do feel free to ask any questions if I haven't covered what you were particularly looking for. So Sluice Fire Company is in the southern part of Tanzania. We've been working with them for about three years now. And for me, they are really having been working in the industry for, for such a long time. They are the epitome of what a safari company should be. They've got this amazing heritage. They're 32 years old. And Charles Doby, who is still at the helm of the company, um, set it up 32 years ago and was one of the first pioneers to go into the SLU game reserve and set up what is now Sarandu Camp. But it has a Sarandu Camp that's actually in its third form. They have battled against various elements over the years and have been, the camp was um, flooded out one year. And so they've had over the years, as, it, as is only the case in, uh, in Africa, true pioneers um, and have been determined in, in their pursuits of really creating this amazing company that's, that's very focused on conservation and very authentic safari experiences. The key thing about Southern Tanzania is really for, it's for those guests who want to get off the beaten track. Um, Sluice Fire Company, uh, as what it was known as is the Salu Game Reserve, but is now as of last year, Nyeri National Park. Um, prior to coming Nyeri National Park, the Salu Game Reserve was the oldest and largest game reserve in Africa. Um, Nyeri National Park, as it was uh, renamed last year and gazetted last year, is now 30,000 square kilometers. And it's still absolute wilderness. I mean, there's, there's got this huge expanse of space with really a handful of photographic safari camps in it. So it's for clients who want to have that amazing game experience, but not have any other crowds, be really kind of getting off the beaten track. And that is what Sleeve Fire Company is all about. So there are three properties. There used to be four. Um, there used to be Vascatani, our beach property as well. But as of um, earlier this year, we have decided sadly to, to close Vascatani. Um, and focus primarily on our beach property, Fanjobi Island. So there are three um, camps in total. Uh, the Suwandu Camp, which is in the area National Park, um, John Gomeri, which is in Ruaha National Park, and then Fanjobi Island, which is um, about 40 minute flight south of Dar es Salaam. And as I mentioned, we used to have Raskatani just south of Dar es Salaam, but sadly, due to the current circumstances and, and it's, and, and basically deciding to really focus predominantly on, the, on their other beach property with um, Fanjovi Island, which joined the portfolio about two years ago. Um, it made sense to really kind of drive all their beach bookings through Fanjovi Island as well. So that's a, that's a new change since, which has been happening over the last, the last kind of six months. But our, our, our rates are very competitive and what they've done, they extended the same rates. They've frozen the rates throughout um, 2020, 2021 and also 21, 22 as well. And we have our low season rates that run throughout the whole year. Um, we also have our stay pay, which is four nights for the price of three, seven for five and 10 for seven. So they're actually very simple to remember. But what we also have done to make it even easier for you is we've created certain itineraries for you. So you can see if your clients have a seven night um, length of stay, you can combine it with Sawandu and Fanjovi Island, or if they want to do uh, maybe more on the beach, we've got different options um, of itineraries that we've created for you, which to give you an idea of kind of a, a ballpark uh, price figure. And this, this price is including everything except for international flights. And that's based on two people shown. So that's a, a two packed price. So it's very, very competitive. Um, but I'll send this all through to you in our follow-up email following the webinar. So um, how do we get around? Well, to fly to Tanzania, some Tanzania, you fly into Dar es Salaam. So there are numerous international flights normally that are flying into Dar es Salaam um, daily. And then the beauty of, of uh, Sawandu and the Nyeri National Park is the location really, the proximity to Dar es Salaam. It's only a 40 to 45 minute flight from Dar. So within a very short space of time, you can be having got to the international airport on, on safari within, a, yeah, within 45 minutes. Um, at Sawandu Camp, the, the, the airstrip is about a 10 minute drive from the camp, although they always make your initial kind of drive through to the camp slightly longer, so you lose your bearings and you feel like it's further away, but actually in reality, it's only about a 10 minute drive to the airstrip, to the camp. Um, and then there are a number of um, domestic flights that fly uh, the route, um, Coastal, Safari Airlink, Uruk Air, um, all fly that route um, from Dar to, um, to Salu. Um, 
At the moment, as you can imagine, the schedules are all slightly up in the air uh, because they just don't have the volume of tourists traveling. So um, at the moment, most of the schedules tend to, tend to be fixed departures. Um, and, um, but we anticipate, hopefully, um, you know, next year, once tourists come back, next season, we're hoping that actually those regular flights will, will come, come back again. It's obviously, as you can imagine, once they've got the, the tourism volumes coming up, I'm sure that the flight numbers will increase as well. Um, and then connecting between Jongamaru, um, there's daily flights from Dar. You can either fly direct, uh, which takes about an hour, an hour and 30 minutes, hour and 20 minutes, or you can fly from, um, from Sulu, from Nyeri National Park, and again with coastal and safari airlink. Um, and the flight between Nyeri National Park and um, Jongamaru and Ruaha depends on um, really on how many um, stops they have to do on route. It's almost like a bus stop service. So if they've got clients on board that want to stop somewhere else, they'll come down and land and fly on. Uh, when I flew there last time, it took me about an hour because we literally were the last stop before going on to Royal Heart, but then previously it's taken about an hour and a half. Um, so it, it, it varies on really other guests and where they're stopping off at. You can also fly from Migration Capital, um, you can fly from Ruaha to Kilimanjaro um, and then also to, um, to uh, Zanzibar as well from, from, from Nyeri um, to, to, to Zanzibar. But again, these flights are all slightly different at the moment, so I'm afraid I can't tell you the exact timings um, or schedule departures because there are none at the moment, but hopefully Obviously, as soon as um, the world writes itself and um, tourist numbers uh, come back to Tanzania and we have the regular scheduled, I'll obviously send you through that detail as soon as we've got it. And getting down to Fanjoli Island is really all part of the adventure. It's about a 40 minute flight from Dar Salaam down to Songo Songo. And Songo Songo is actually the same flight as Mafia Island. So they land at Mafia Island first and then it's a short hop onto Songo Songo. It's the most beautiful flight because you're following the Tanzanian coastline down from Dar es Salaam. So it's, it's really, really stunning flight. Um, and then you jump out of Songo Songo Airport. There's a little tuk-tuk waiting for you. And it's about a five minute tuk-tuk ride across Songo Songo Island. And then it's about a 40 minute down transfer across the island. Um, but I'll tell you more about that when we get to that stage of the presentation. But it is really all part of the adventure is, uh, is the flight down to, um, to uh, Fanjovi and the, the journey down to Fanjovi. So as I mentioned, Suwandu is really where Salou's Fire Company started. That's its home. Um, Charles Davey, the, the MD, was one of the first pioneers to go into what was then Salou Game Reserve. Um, and is now, as of last year, the Airing National Park. So Salou Game Reserve is four times the size of Serengeti. Um, and the area National Park now has been, they've, they've effectively taken over the northern part of the game reserve and they've made it to the area National Park. Um, it, this means it's now going to be managed by TANAPA, uh, the Tanzanian National Parks Authority, which is great because it means we'll have more rangers, more uh, resources to be able to actually manage this, what's still an amazingly big wilderness. Um, the, the park fees are, may well change. There is, it is in discussion at the moment. Um, and so they haven't been finalised yet um, because there are various discussions going back and forth between the stakeholders and TANAPA. But again, once we have those finalised, I'll send them through to you. Um, but the Wandu camp itself is lo located on Lake Nizakura, um, which is this beautiful, big, um, wide open lake. And it's, what's great about this area is obviously, because as you can imagine, you know, this, this area gets very, very dry. And, and because it's a permanent water source, it means there's always, always game around Sawandu and around Lake Nezakira. Um, as I mentioned, the nearest airstrip is Sawandu airstrip, and it's about a 10 minute drive to the, to the camp. Um, other camps in this area, there are really only a handful in the area national park. Um, we have Asilia have, have a camp, um, we have a Kapala camp. I know further down, you've got Sand Rivers and Bayo Bayo over here, but really there's about eight camps in this area of the national park. So. It, it, compared to other areas of Tanzania, it is just very, very sparsely populated, which is incredible for guests who want to go somewhere where they will literally not see other guests and be um, the only kind of safari vehicle. But obviously with that comes downsides because without as many vehicles around, you can't um, report or back on sightings and therefore guides don't always know exactly where the game is. So it's a little bit harder um, game experience. You have to work a little bit harder for it. But, Again, in our area, it's such a game-rich area. There's always, always a lot to see. I think being on this lake is just beautiful because it's a very calming influence. Um, so uh, the rates are 765 US dollars, and that's the same rate throughout the whole year. The only thing you have to remember is if you've got guests um, staying for longer periods of time, so we have a stay um, pay, stay pay offers of um, four nights of price of three, seven for five, and ten for seven, and they can be combined with different camps. 
So that's the reason why we put together these itineraries because you can actually use all three camps and get a really um, varied but quite um, representative experience of, of Southern Africa. Activities, you've got game walks, you've got the lake obviously so you can do um, fishing, it's on a catch and release basis and there's a small um, charge for um, uh, park free charge for fishing. We have our pontoon boat, um, which you'll see in shortly, which is we set up for beautiful lunches or sundowners, obviously game drives, and we also do children's game walks, and that's actually done within the vicinity of the camp. Because the camp is quite spread out, um, but there's actually, a, and, and, and game walks, as, as I'm sure lots of you know, it's all about the small things. It's all about the leaves, the bugs, the, the spore, the tracks, so you can actually do that within the camp itself as well. You don't have to go outside of the camp because normally you have to be over a 16 to, um, to do a walk. Um, so this is the, 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 the camp itself. So it's divided into two. There are 13 tents in total. It's divided into South Camp and North Camp. And this design it offers real flexibility in terms of being able to be quite adaptable. So say, for example, if we have an exclusive, view, um, exclusive group or to take over somewhere entirely, we give them North Camp and both North Camp and South Camp have their own swimming pool, they have their own communal area, they have their own um, chill out area. So actually you can um, yeah, be completely exclusively using uh, Northern Camp, North Camp and have no idea that they're actually guests in South Camp because they're all uh, located along the edge of the lake, but all kind of quite far apart, but in the trees. So you can't obviously see it. So only when you go out to the boat and you look back at the camp, you realize there's other, there's other properties, uh, other rooms there. Um, so it offers real flexibility. Um, so we have this is our, our the view of most of the rooms looking out over this beautiful lake. So the tents are actually designed in an octagonal shape, very cleverly, so that the air really circulates around, around and all the edge of the tent, the bedroom area, is is uh, is netting. Um, and I went when there first late September um, three years ago, and I'd come from uh, from Pembroke Island, which was unbelievably humid, and and came to Salou, but oh my gosh, it's going to be so hot. But actually. I have to say, it was hot, but it's a dry heat, and at night time it really drops down, so it's still very um, comfortable. But the air does really circulate well around the tents. Um, and they all have this lovely big wooden veranda, this beautiful lake view, and uh, little desk area and dining area and chill out area on the veranda in front of the tents. Um, they all obviously have ensuite bathrooms, um, outdoor showers, and every, every tent you have your own personal butler looking after you, which is great because it means the guests really get to know their staff fantastically well and the staff I have to say it's least by company are amazing the company's been going 32 years and I think the average length of staff stay is something like 22 or something crazy it's it, they, they've got real um, um, kind of loyalty with their staff and particularly in the last few months they've been amazing to their staff keeping them all on rotating them in terms of um, um, work whether they've been on active service or or, or uh, at home, or just keep making sure they're all engaged. It really is like a big family. Um, and that really comes through at the guests' stay. You can really tell that from the, the, the comments they come back from the staff. Um, so this is a North Camp swimming pool, and then the swimming pool at South Camp. Um, so you never feel, there are 13 tents, but you never feel like you're, you're more than kind of six other rooms because they, they spread them out um, properly and they really make sure that if, say, for example, a family are coming, uh, we don't have family rooms as such, but we could give them North Camp so they can have that exclusively if they wanted to. <coughs> Excuse me. This is our pontoon boat, which I mentioned earlier. So we tend to keep this as a surprise, a surprise for guests. So they'll be told to come to the dining room for their, for their lunch or for their sundowners. And then off they go with their beautiful pontoon um, lunch set up. And they go cruising around the lake um, with a game all around them with this, with the, with their, whilst having their lunch, which is always a real kind of highlight for the guests. So game walks is a, is a, um, a big focus for us, or both at uh, um, John Romero and at Salou. And all, our guys are, um, up until now in Suwandi, they haven't had to, had to have a Tanapa ranger with them because it hasn't been a national park. So our guys themselves have been able to do game walks whilst um, fully armed. As of now, it's becoming a national park. We will have to have a Tanapa ranger with us as well. It makes no difference to the, to the, the situation and the experience. It just means there's a small incremental cost for doing the game walk because you have to have this guide there and it costs $45. Um, but absolutely every guest coming through should really do a game walk because as you can see from Emil, um, our, our, one of our managers on the right hand side, you know, the, the enjoyment of the small things and the millipedes and the leaves and the whatever, whatever else you can find is just really kind of engaging and it really feels like you know you as guests you get out and you, you a it's lovely to do a bit of a walk and burn off the substantial safari food but also to really feel like you um 
for me, the whole spa experience opens up. Suddenly you're much more, your sense is much more heightened, you're much more aware of the grasses and the symbiotic nature of, um, of the bush, which is just, which you don't get from a, from a vehicle. So St. Louis is uh, one of the best places in Africa to see wild dog after Botswana. Um, because they need such a huge territory, and obviously in, um, in the national, near a national park, they have this enormous territory. Um, so there's about, they think there's about a thousand wild dog um, in the area. And, um, and they have about 80% of their, of their hunts actually uh, result in a kill. So they are highly efficient hunters. And we're very lucky because there's actually been, um, in the last couple of years, they've denned very, very near to Sawandu. So our guests have seen them a lot which is amazing because obviously they're harder to see because their territory is so big because they cover such a large area when, when they are hunting. Um, but this is very popular. We get every, um, every uh, month we get through game reports of exactly what guests have seen. And so we know exactly what percentage of guests have seen elephant, wild dog, and wild dog are always, always um, up there. So moving really on to Shongamere. Shongamere is in Luaha National Park. So Luaha is a really interesting park. It's, um, it's almost where, it's almost split into two. The southern part of the park is much more like Southern Africa. So it's where the kind of two biomes of Africa meet. So the southern part of the park is much more like Southern Africa. So more kind of copies and bush scrub. And the, uh, the northern part of the park is much more almost like um, open savanna, like East Africa. So it's actually a really lovely park to do a twin center within it. And because it is further to get to, this is really highly recommended because once, once you have flown all the way there, you can have a very, very varied safari experience within the park itself. It takes about two and a half hours to drive between Jongamere, which is here, and the more southern part of the park. And then um, this area here, which is where the other camps like Nomad and Silly have their camps up in the north here. But we often, often do, um, we often actually meet halfway and exchange and, and pass the guests over. So this is something that's very, very easy to organize. And our reservation team are amazing. They can very, very easily organize that if you have clients who wanted to do that twin center within the park. So John Romero is in the kind of more southern part of the park and it's, it's about 40 kilometers away from the nearest camp. So it's very, very isolated. This is for me is, is, is true wilderness. Um, there are only eight tents, so it's smaller than Sawamdu, um, and again, very reasonably priced. And it's, very, it's, it's built around this um, dry seasonal river called John Romero River, um, which is amazing because it's a real focal for, uh, focus for the game, because particularly the elephants during the, the dry months will come and then dig down under the riverbed to get the water they know is under, underneath all the sand. Um, so there's always game around, around the riverbed and around where the camp is. Um, as I mentioned earlier, there's regular flights from either directly from Dar or from, from Salou, from the area National Park, but also from northern Tanzania as well. So um, there were daily fast flights to Migration Capital and also to Kilimanjaro um, and also to uh, Zanzibar as well. Um, so these obviously are, as I mentioned earlier, slightly up in the air at the moment, um, but we're hoping that they will come back once, once tourists do come back in, 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 in force, which hopefully will be next season. Um, again, activity is the key focus of the game, the game drives, game walks, and we also do fly camping in um, John Romero and Luaha, which is a, a real kind of wilderness experience. It's an amazing kind of get away from it all experience. So the lounge and bar area is, is located on this elevated um, viewpoint overlooking the, the, the dry riverbed. And it's wooden floors and thatched um, roofs, and it's just always, as I mentioned, there's always game around this area. Um, there is, we do have our, our staff will walk guests backwards and forwards to their rooms, particularly at night, because there's often eddies coming through this area. When I was there last November, we had a herd of 300 elephants that had been in the camp just a day before we arrived, uh, which was absolutely amazing. Um, amazing. And even when we were there, there were so many elephants around, it was just phenomenal. These are the rooms, so we're all overlooking um, the dry river bed, really big spacious rooms, um, tented feel. But thatched roofs are very, very solid, particularly if you're nervous about the game being around. It's, it's very, very solid. You feel very, very safe. Um, obviously, on suite bathrooms with, with showers and then our, our swimming pool as well. Um, this is, we have Wi-Fi in all our camps, um, and which is something we debated a lot when I started far, first started working with Salou's Fire Company three years ago. And the reality is that it's such an important marketing element. And, and actually, but we're very, very focused on having the Wi-Fi in certain areas and at certain times. So the idea is that yes, if they need to connect, which actually, you know, the reality is unfortunately everyone does these days, they can do, but if they don't want to, they don't have to connect and it's not everywhere, it's not in the rooms. It's just in certain areas that you can go to and connect. Um, this is our elevated pool, which is where the Wi-Fi is. 
Um, and it's often we have these friendly visitors who like coming in and saying hello. Um, so with all our camps, we really vary where we set up for dinner, um, particularly as we have guests often staying for quite a few nights. So we'll, we'll sometimes have dinner by the pool or in the dry riverbed or in the lounge area. This is a beautiful um, acacia woodland, which is very near, which is, is just normally full of game. Um, and in John Romero in this area, because there's quite a few dry riverbeds, it's a very varied, um, varied kind of environment to drive around. There's lots of different areas you can go and find lots of game, hippos, um, there's, yeah, there's more kind of slightly more savannah style and the acacia woodland. So it's, it's lovely because you can go for drives and every day go to a totally different area. And then again, you have these amazing walk experiences like you do in um, Sawandu as well. And because Rawahas National Park, um, you have a Tanapa Ranger that comes with you. And often you'll do a, a walking safari experience, which will then end up in this beautiful bush breakfast overlooking the, the river. Our fly camping runs from 15th of November, 15th of August to 15th of November, and that's because it's a dry season. So obviously, as you can imagine, they need to make sure that um, vis visibility is very good. Um, so they, they tend to stop it on 15th of November, really when they feel that the bush is getting too dense. But this is an absolutely amazing experience. And one of the, the tour operators we work with said to me they used to buy this, um, this for honeymoon clients, they used to actually buy this fly camping experience for them as a gift because I understand for agents, it's hard to understand why to, uh, it's a tricky thing to sell uh, to clients when you've got a beautiful room in a camp and you're telling them to basically pay a supplement, which is all park fees, the lodge doesn't take anything, um, all park fees to then have this stay in a more rustic tent, the reality is. But it honestly is the most amazing wilderness experience. The, the camp itself is about a 25 minute drive from John Gamero, but what we normally do is drive there and then, and then drop the guests and their guide off and they'll walk the last kind of hour and turn it back into, the, into the, the camp. So they'll arrive on foot to their, their mobile um, camp. Then the next day, if they want to, they can walk all the way back to camp. Um, but if they obviously don't want to, they can get the safari vehicle. Um, but it is just beautiful, just kind of you and you have, um, we, don't, we don't have two lots of guests staying there at the same time, it's a, it's a private experience. So you'll have either your family or your, your, um, your partner or whatever. Um, and then you have a chef and a small team of staff that look after you. Um, but you really are kind of absolutely getting away from it all. Roja is well known for its beautiful big baobabs, its iconic baobabs. But it really is um, a park that actually has had the spotlight put on it for the last few years, which is great. With the new camps of the city and Nomad opening up, it's really getting the attention it, it deserves. It's such a varied park and it's very, very beautiful. Um, but because it was slightly more of a beaten track. Um, it just never really kind of got as much um, exposure as it should do, but it's a, it's a camp that, it, it's a park that again, the clients have maybe been on Spy before, really appreciate going somewhere where it is going to be, you know, you won't see other vehicles, then definitely um, Ruaha is a great option for you as well. And then last but no, no means least is Fanjovi Island. So Fanjovi is this, in the Songo Songo archipelago, um, and it is, absolutely beautiful. Um, it's a, an island, it's a, it's a coral island, so it's got a coral reef all around it. It's an 11 kilometer coral reef and there's only six banders. They call their rooms banders and there's only six banders on the island. So it is, it's very rustic, it's very feet in the sand, it's very, it's, it's really all about the environment and particularly the marine environment. This lighthouse um, is, is a very iconic lighthouse and it, it dates back to 1884 and it was a, a German lighthouse and when Sleeve Spy Company first took over Van Jovi two years ago, um, they actually um, made it structurally sound and built this like a viewing uh, gallery from the top and the, and the light. Um, and it's now a great spot for sundowners um, to go up there. In fact, when we were first at Van Jovi two years ago, um, we were sitting there having beers on the, on the, having a sundown on the beach and the manager was like, you know, today is a very special day. And we're like, yes, because we're here on Van Jovi at last. And he said, no, no, today is the first time the light has shone on the lighthouse for 54 years since independence. Um, and they fixed the light that day. And it's just amazing. It's not a strong lighthouse beam light, because that would probably be not so great for guests staying there, but it's a very gentle light that comes around. So it's a, it's a really amazingly iconic focal point for the island. So the island itself is about um, a kilometre long. In the northern part, you have more of the coral um, uh, um, kind of style. So the more coral rocks, and the southern part is more sandy. And the southern part is where the main um, accommodation is. It takes me about half an hour, 40 minutes to walk around the whole island and there's a little nature trail you can follow. This area here is amazing for bird life. They have a lot of migratory species that come through here. 
Um, and then, yeah, as I say, this is the main part where the dining area and the, the, get the rooms are. Um, so they're only six pounds. It's very, very well priced because this price, don't forget, is we also have a long stay um, offers. So uh, for what's the price of three, seven for five and ten for seven. So it makes it very, very affordable. The reason, part of the reason why it's priced so well is because we are aware, obviously, it is more expensive to get to um, from Dar es Salaam. The, the, the flight is normally around $500 return. So it is quite expensive to get to. So um, it, it's very, very affordable once you're on the island. Um, and it's very, when they first took over the management of it a couple of years ago, the initial plan was to actually maybe do a big redevelopment. But then as they got to know the island, they felt that actually the style of the island, the style of the banders, really fits into the vibe of the island, which is very, very chilled out, very much all about um, you know, celebrating the environment, not about staying in a kind of luxury lodge. Um, so this is Songlo Songlo Airport, and this is the tuk-tuk that greets you off the plane. And it's about a five minute drive across the island and, and the tuk-tuk, there's only two tuk-tuks on Songo Songo and it's hilarious every time you go on a bend your driver's busy beeping away just in case our tuk-tuk happens to be coming in the opposite direction at that point. Um, but again it's all part of the experience and then you jump into the tuk-tuk and you're met by this beautiful old traditional sailing down that, that tells you for about 40 minutes across the island and you see this, this lovely lighthouse just getting closer and closer. Um, so the island is, is just absolutely beautiful. Off this main beach is the most you know, amazing coral reef and essential destinations who actually owned the island before so these fire companies took it over did an amazing job in working really closely with the community in terms of marine conservation. So when they first arrived, um, nearly all the octopus had been fished out and over the over years they, they then worked with the fishermen to actually assist them and maybe educate them in, in terms of actually um, harvesting the oct octopus, whereby if they actually didn't harvest all the octopus at once, and if they, they um, managed the harvesting, they'll actually have a far more um, effective harvest for the following year. And actually octopus numbers have really come back. Um, fishing numbers have really come back because they've actually created this very, very strong, very effective um, community fishing, uh, community fishing um, system. And Salus Fire Company has taken that on and actually expanded it uh, as well. So it's a really positive marine ecology story. Um, these are the banders. So they're, they're really quite rustic. They're not for every kind of client, um, but they are absolutely perfect. They're quite, you can shut the doors at night or keep them open if you want to, to the breeze. They've got a little steps up here in a little veranda area, balcony area here. Um, and they, they don't have a family unit at the moment, but there's definitely plans to build one. Um, they're gonna hopefully do one for, for next season. Um, because they realise actually this is the most amazing spot for kids as well because it's totally safe. It's, it is tidal but not tidal like we get in Zanzibar um, and there's not hugely strong currents so in terms of being safe to swim it's, it's just perfect for kids and in terms of the marine environment it's just absolutely mind-blowing for all of them. It's mind-blowing for everyone but you know kids especially. So this is the interiors. Um, the bathroom is behind uh, with a, a, a lovely big shower and then the dining is a dining hall as well. So it's very much feet in the sand. In fact, you get there, you never take your shoes off. Actually, you do wear your shoes because sometimes the sand gets really hot, but you definitely, definitely don't wear anything other than flip-flops. Um, and the food is, is sensational. So to these by company, when they took over, they, they really did a huge, but a big part of their kind of initial investment was behind the scenes. So in terms of building a new kitchen and really working on training the, the, the chefs up, on the food. So the food now is absolutely amazing. We get fantastic reviews about it. Obviously, fresh seafood, fish, there's no octopus on the menu um, because of the octopus harvesting and, and managing it, but there's actually uh, you know, amazing, amazing fish um, and just a beautiful spot to, for, to be able to eat it from. And then obviously the lighthouse. So you've got this amazing sundown views from the lighthouse. So what do you do whilst you're on this beautiful desert island? Well, there's lots of different excursions you can do. One of them is a sandbank excursion, which we take clients out with a picnic lunch, and then we'll leave them on the sandbar. We do come and pick them up again, obviously. Um, they're left with the radio, and it's just, uh, you know, just you and your family or your partner just on the sandbar on your own. They have some amazing wildlife on the island. These are coconut clams, which are the world's largest clams, and they're very, very rare. And there's quite a few on Fanjovi Island. Um, and so we, as part of the, we're part of the world um, coconut crab mapping program. So we um, monitor the coconut crabs regularly, measure them, feedback and report back on what's been seen. Um, and then bird life is just phenomenal. If you're keen on birds, then it's an amazing spot for seeing the migratory species coming forward, coming through. 
Diving is, um, we have a, a Paddy dive school. We're not, we don't um, teach diving, so we can't, you can't do dive, um, you can't do a dive certification while you're there, but if you are diving, you can definitely dive. This is our dive school, um, and the diving there is amazing, because obviously we've got this amazing coral reef that's 11 kilometers long and, and no one else is there. So it's very, very pristine um, diving experience. We also have lots of dolphins that come through this area, <coughs> and whales as well. So. So when I was there last, we went on, <coughs> excuse me, went on a marine um, excursion and we went out and um, we saw a pod of about, I oh, didn't pause the dolphins, we must have seen about 220 dolphins. And then when we, we got to one pod of dolphins, Hakeem, the, diet, the activities manager said, right, do you want to go, do you want to go and swim with the dolphins? We're like, yeah, of course. So we, we put on our mask and our snorkel and we lowered ourselves very slowly into the water and held onto the side of the boat. And we were almost like, lying horizontal to the side of the boat, holding onto uh, the, the, the rope thing. And then they start up the engine very, very slowly and the dolphins just love the boat. So they all swim and they didn't really see us because we were part of the boat effectively. And they all swim around this boat. And so we had a pod of about 40 dolphins swimming all around us, communicating all around us. It was just one of those experiences that I'll never ever forget. Um, it was just absolutely sensational. And then we also saw a humpback whale. This was not my photo, unfortunately, but we saw a mother humpback whale and her baby. She was smacking her tail in the water and we thought she was calling a mate. And then we saw her baby came right by our, right by our boat. We actually, my colleague Catherine wrote a blog about it and we've got a video on our, on our blog. So I'll send you the link to the blog and the follow up of our, of our presentation. But it was really, really sensational experience. And what was amazing, there's, there were no other tourists around. It was just fantastic. We also um, have obviously baby turtles and we help with the turtle hatching as well. Um, and then our DAO as well, we have guests that always enjoy going out on the Sunset DAO cruise. So there's really a lot of activities you can do on Fanjavi Island. As I say, it's not for every guest, it's, as you can see, it's, it's very rustic, but the marine environment and the, the beauty of the island is just what it's all about. So for those guests who are probably a little bit more intrepid, um, they'll just absolutely love it. So that draws me to the end of the presentation. Um, I think I have a couple of questions that have popped up, so I'll try and answer them there. Um, question from Paul Mulder saying, has Bastani been taken over by another company and is it still open? No, it's, it's, as far as I know, it's definitely closed. Um, it's not been taken over by another company in its current form. So it will not be opening as, unfortunately, as a small little beach lodge, which is a real shame because it was, it was lovely. Mira says, it's the best time to travel to the parks and the best time for Fanjovi Island, please. It is. I mean, Fanjovi Island, to be quite honest, well, all our camps, to be quite honest, are quite quiet because they are small camps in areas that are very wilderness areas. That's always been the beauty of Sleetify Company. But 100%, I mean, the feedback coming back from people who are out in Africa is just saying it's just the best time to go. We were supposed to be there. We we're supposed to be there as a family in October. Unfortunately, in the UK, you have to quarantine still for two weeks when you come back. So I just can't justify that with, with, with children not going to school. But if I didn't have children, I'd be there like a shot. Because um, you can now get travel insurance to, to ha you know, that, you, that will cover you for um, travelling when there's an SEO advisory. Um, question from Natalie saying, what is the best time to see whales here? So the best time, we got the end of the season. We were um, November and that was the end of the humpback whale season. Um, they were moving back up to the Arctic at that point. I've actually got a, a, a grid, a monthly activity plan, which I'll send through to you, which tells you all the different kind of best months of doing various different things. Um, and uh, so I'll send that through to you in the follow-up. Um, the question saying, as Randy, what is the age limit for children to go on safari? And also, are they allowed at Jongo? Yeah, it's from eight and above, and um, the rates are really, really affordable. It's like $130. Um, so, but I'll send you that through to the rates um, before I, in my follow-up to um, the presentation. And uh, Natalie says, where can we do a COVID test before flying out? That's a very good question, actually. There are COVID, you can do COVID tests in, in Dar es Salaam, but I know because we work with Zanzibar White Sands in Zanzibar, if you can end your holiday in Zanzibar, you can actually get tests done at the hotels. And I think it's about $150. Um, because depending on the airline, the tests have to be done, obviously, a few days before flying, a couple of days before flying. So um, unfortunately, we can't arrange this at Fanjovi because the whole beauty of Fanjovi is it's very isolated and that would just be too expensive. But if you could end your, end your trip, um, maybe with stay at Zanzibar, you are obviously then going to be able to do a test while staying at the hotel, which is going to be much more kind of palatable than, um, than having to wait around um, the, the airport or the cities. But things are changing so fast that um, we really anticipate that, you know, um, 
whether we have more testing facilities or we can change it to the Bearby, we can get testing done whilst you're staying at something like Sawandi, which is close to Dar es Salaam. Every day, every, every day it's almost changing. So I will keep you updated. What we're actually working on at the moment is a, is a logistics um, newsletter and document with everything from kind of what is currently needed in terms of international flights, in terms of tests, in terms of if your guests get ill, what happens to them. So I will send that up to you as a, as a very user-friendly PDF, which obviously will have to be updated regularly, but it will at least give you a guide as to exactly what the requirements are currently. Um, but I think that's the end of the, the presentation. Hopefully no more questions coming through, which hopefully means I've answered them all. But thank you very much for joining me this afternoon. Our, our presentation, our webinar next Tuesday is on, um, uh, is on Zambia and it'll be co-hosted by Nick Aslan from Zambia and Ground Handlers as well as Nicholas Best from Latitude Hotels and Jason Mott from Sausage Tree Camp and of course myself. So that's next Tuesday, so I'll send you the link to that. And we've also got a webinar coming up on Madagascar, which is really exciting as well, and South Africa. So I will send you um, links to the webinars once they've been, uh, the dates been finalised. But thank you so much for joining me this afternoon. I will follow up with you all by sending an email with the webinar recording and the rates and the various bits of information I've spoken about. Um, but thanks so much for joining me this afternoon and hopefully see you all at the uh, next webinar, at the Zambia webinar next week. Thanks a lot.